the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We're only a couple weeks into Lent, but already our eyes are set on Jerusalem, and we know we'll get there. Last week, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, the very last temptation pointed us to Jerusalem and whether or not Jesus was willing to trust the Lord. <coughs> Today, we have that message about Jerusalem as Jesus is heading to his ultimate end or beginning. Jesus, and I think if we were there in the moment of this reading, we'd feel the power in his voice, maybe even the quiver in his voice. It doesn't say he was in tears, but I can't imagine him describing what he'd seen in Jerusalem and what would happen in Jerusalem without at least some quiver in his voice. This place, this place that was a meeting place between God and humanity, a place that was a holy place where people could come and commune with God and offer uh, their gifts and their life to God and make pilgrimage and leave somehow transformed by that interaction with God has become an economic place, a political place, a place where power and the things of this world have corrupted. And so prophets go there and unfortunately have made their end. Because often when religion, politics, and economics come together, the powers of this world destroy. I can only imagine, as Jesus thinks about what has become of Jerusalem, about the hurt that Jerusalem has caused, about his ultimate journey towards Jerusalem, it is not just a passing statement. And Jesus describes it this way. First, the Pharisees are saying to him, uh, don't go. Herod is after you. And we get from earlier passages that Herod isn't so much uh, relentlessly after him. He's kind of fascinated with him. Uh, he wants to see him perform a, a, a trick or two, um, but Herod wants more than anything to hold on to his power, his earthly power. And so the more Jesus heals, the more Jesus reveals the power of God's love, the more power and charisma and energy that galvanates behind Jesus, the more of a threat he is to Herod, to earthly power. Jesus, again, foreshadowing what is to come, says, I've got work to do, and I won't be done that work until the third day, until the third day. Getting a little ahead of ourselves on our journey. Uh, and then he uses this incredible metaphor. He refers to Herod as the fox. Uh, and instead of playing a game of Rochambeau where he himself is a wolf or a tiger or a lion or an elephant or a bear or something uh, that would trump fox, he says, I am a hen, an incredibly vulnerable hen. And they say, this is one of the most vulnerable positions that you can have because you've exposed everything um, that, is, uh, that is vulnerable in you. Uh, and he says, he's like a hen who lifts his wings to take us, to take all of his chicks under his wings. And the only weapon he gives himself is his flesh. The only weapon that he has left is that maybe the fox would be so satiated by that mother hen that puts himself first or herself first that the other chicks would be able to scatter away and the fox would go away full. That is the only defense that he offers. Wow. Let's go back to those three images I've asked you to hold on to during this uh, Lenten journey. That first image as ashes were smudged on your forehead, that you are dust. But you're dust that was made holy because the love of a hen, the love of Jesus, gave you life and redeemed your life. You're pretty powerful dust. You're dust bound together by divine love. 
of that image of bread. So it's nothing but dead, crushed grains of wheat brought together unless you're given to fill the stomach of a hungry child in solidarity with those that hunger in this world. Or that you're lifted up and blessed and given over to others as the body of Christ, hope and redemption and love poured out for the world. Or like that vessel, the vessel that Paul talks about or that vessel that that poor child dropped uh, that she'd been working on for her mother, that we are but clay jars. We're but a container except for the fact that we are filled with the love that we see in this illustration, the love of a hen that is willing to sit there and be devoured by a fox so that we might have life and have it abundantly. That is who we are, and that is whose we are. Remember that moment in Ash Wednesday where I also reminded us, because God reminded us, that we matter more than we could ever possibly imagine, yet we don't matter all that much at all. I say all this as I was struck this week with some stories in the news, uh, a, a couple absolutely uh, tragic. Um, the airline, uh, the Ethiopian Airlines uh, crash, just absolutely devastating. And then uh, one that's both devastating and so contrary to the very nature of God, who is love, who is compassion, whatever reflection of the divine uh, you worship, that core identity is resolute. That people are lifting up arms and killing people in the name of a God. How corrupted is that image that we have of a hen made when we do that to one another? How corrupted is the purpose of Jerusalem, a place where people can com come and commune with the loving God uh, when it becomes a war land where different religions fight against each other. And then the last story that sort of stayed in my crawl has been the story of academic corruption. Largely because I think it stands in violation of all of these principal truths. We don't matter as much as we think we do. We really don't. But we matter more than we could ever imagine. And as parents, it is our responsibility to make sure that we remind the children how much they matter and why they matter and don't build up the part that doesn't really matter that much at all. And I think we fail more often than we succeed. And I think one of the things that caused me such uh, consternation about this story uh, is that as much as it crossed a line, uh, and I really could say to myself, I would never be on that side of the line, I realized that I walk a little closer to that line than I'd like to admit. I sent my kid to expensive preschool, and then... I sent my kid to an extra year of expensive preschool, so they'd start out with all of the advantages that money could buy. They're not here today because they're doing travel sports, which is something that only a rarefied part of society get to participate in so that they might have an extra leg up. Um, if my child needed tutoring, I'd make sure that they got tutoring. If my child needed SAT uh, additional instruction, I would probably bend towards that. Uh, and at some point, I have to ask myself, as much as I'm in solidarity with my son and my daughter, how in solidarity am I with all of those chicks that Jesus gathers under his wings? Where is the limit to how much I am willing to put my solidarity with my children above my solidarity with God's children? We talked about it at school. One of the great things about having it, a school, uh, and I think that the principles that we reinforce again and again at St. James uh, run so contrary to that. Uh, but I told this story. I compared. I told uh, the story of what happened in the news. I don't normally share news stories um, with the, the, the children, but it was the upper elementary, and we talked a little bit about it. Um, and they talked about where they felt like uh, this was out of line with the things that they learn here at St. James. And then I told this story. A story about uh, the Special Olympics. And if you ever worked with uh, Special Olympians, you realize that there is a little... Uh, little intensity as significant as a Special Olympian training for the Special Olympics. Uh, it is infinitely 
infinitely important to each one of them. Uh, in some, it is a, a, an achievement uh, and a medal in a world that hasn't given them enough achievement and medal uh, to hang their hat on, and they work tirelessly. Uh, and so the day for the big meet came, um, and they were all lined up, and they had been prepping uh, and going to meets uh, to get to this place, uh, and they were ready. They were all ready, and they stretched, and they got ready. Um, and when the gun uh, fired, they started to run. And they got to the very last part of the race, the very last lap, uh, and the person in first looked back and saw that they were going to win, uh, and looking back caused them to stumble, and they started to stumble, and they lost their balance and the, fell, and the person in second all of a sudden had that moment of realization they were going to win. Now, I know I tell this story as somebody who's competitive as just about anybody and who really believes in using our abilities uh, to the best that we can, uh, but this story melts me because I think it's a story about the kingdom of God. And the person uh, who's about to win the race uh, starts running and gets, and then looks back and looks back again and freezes and stops and walks back and helps that person up. And then the person in third who has the opportunity to fulfill a dream stops and holds arms with the other two until the point where all of them walk across the finish line at the same time. And I asked the children, how do these two, two stories differ? And they said that the parent who cheated to get their child into school can only see their own lane, can only see what's in their own lane. But these children can see all of the lane and realize that they're all in it together. This is from a fourth grader. I think that image of Jesus willing to make himself vulnerable, of not being a lion or tiger, but a hen whose only defense is her flesh, should remind us of what is the essence of our being. We are dust filled to the gills with that kind of love. Do we live like that? Do we teach our children that they don't matter that much at all, but that they matter more than they will ever, ever know? I sure hope so. Amen.